All right, fantastic. I'm going to get Common to come and read the scripture for us. Now Common will come and read the scriptures. Oh, heads up. Um, today's reading is from Matthew 5, 23 to 26, and 6, 11 to 15. Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much for the scripture reading, Carmen. And thank you so much for sharing with us, Kathy. Um, it's a real blessing to have you here, as well as other guests who are here today as well. It's a, it's a wonderful blessing. All right. Well, um, I've just come back from a few weeks away uh, on holiday. I went to conduct a friend's wedding in Singapore. And uh, some of you might know the Rahajas. Uh, they have a younger brother called David. So um, he was one of my groomsmen. So to be able to marry him or to conduct his wedding, sorry, just to, in case you're confused, um, was a blessing. <laughs> and uh, then after that, we spent some time with the Clarks. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to see how God is moving in Thailand, in Chiang Mai. Uh, through missions and ministry, and then we spent some time with some family as well in Malaysia, and, and that's always a joy. Uh, but just uh, to say that God is is working everywhere. He's on the move. He's restoring lives. He's renewing uh, situations. He's bringing breakthroughs. And even just my cousin, uh, just chatting with him over some, um, some seafood uh, dinner in, in Malaysia, and he told me about how he got saved. And oh, it was so beautiful. He just his friends around him were just saying, uh, "Hey, Kevin, uh, you know Christianity is good. Jesus is good." And he's like, "Oh yeah, whatever," you know. And it's good for you. It's good for your kids. And then he had kids, and I was, "Oh, I better go to church." Went to church, heard the gospel, got saved. His wife saw the drastic change in his life, and she's like, "I'm gonna go too." <laughs> then the whole family became believers. It's beautiful, beautiful. Just seeing God move uh, is so beautiful. Now, um, uh, also, I think it, you can get up on the screen now. Uh, the first slide I wanted to show you, actually, was uh, we got a message from Dave Ryan. He's the chair of our council, and he's on mission in India right now with a team. And uh, he just sent a message saying, hey, I just had the privilege of being invited to help baptize six people who've just given their lives to Jesus. And that is always a joy. Can we give thanks to God for that? That's always a joy, seeing people come to faith. Um, and along those lines, we are aiming to have another baptism service on the 18th of June, 18th, yeah? Yeah, so um, just had someone contact me and Mel this past week and said, oh, I've got something I need to tell you. I was like, oh, is everything okay? You know, oh, we'll come over. So they came over on Wednesday night, sat down with the family, and they said, I've just decided to receive God into my life. And we're there, we're like, yes, that is so cool, you know, and they wanted to tell us before today, I'm not going to say who it is, so they can tell you the news as well. They're going to get baptized on uh, Saturday, Sunday the 18th, and if you uh, have given your life to Jesus and not yet been baptized, or you want to make that decision to follow Jesus and declare it publicly, please let us know, because uh, we want to get you ready for that, uh, for the 18th of June, which is going to be in the city, combined and it's going to be nice and warm, uh, warmer in the city than it is here. Jesus, we come before you and we ask you to 
soften our hearts to your word. As we start to talk about forgiveness today, um, particularly when we have harmed others, would you transform our hearts so that we can walk in the freedom of forgiveness? We ask, Holy Spirit, that indeed you will pour out your presence upon us like rain. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today we're starting a new series, and it's about Jesus and freedom. And uh, in particular, we're going to be, over the next couple months, tackling issues where Jesus wants to set people free. Uh, We can't cover everything because it's just such a huge kind of range of issues, so we've highlighted a few. And today we're going to be talking about freedom and forgiveness. Um, I want to ask a question. When you do something that hurts, offends, or insults someone else, how do you usually respond? Okay, so you know you've done something, you've hurt someone, you insulted someone, you realize that. How do you respond? What goes on in you? So for me, yeah, like think about it just for a moment. Think about the last time you insulted someone or hurt someone. What goes on for you? When I was reflecting on this, most of the time, for me, uh, my my defense attorney uh, rocks up. I call him Defensive Andy. And Defensive Andy is trying to externally and internally, sometimes to God, sometimes to myself, sometimes to other people, tries to defend what I've said or done advocates, you know, Your Honor, but this happened, right? And he will try to do everything he can to make Andy look like the good guy, and if possible, look like the victim. Anyone else have a defense attorney like that experiences? That's what happens. So I don't know what happens to you, but that's what happens for me. Now, um, some of us, right, some of us say sorry all the time. Anyone, anyone in your life you know that says sorry all the time? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Why are you saying sorry? <laughs> you know, I'm just sorry, okay? You know, so we might be on this side of the spectrum where we feel like we're always wrong. Sometimes even when we're not, I'm sorry. And believe it or not, that's actually not a good thing. It's not a healthy thing for us. Sometimes we might be on the other side of the spectrum. Man, we are going to go down in a blaze of glory before we say we, we say we're sorry, right, before we admit that we're wrong. You know, I think of young guns when I think of that phrase. Young guns too. All right, so where are you on the spectrum? <laughs> are you somewhere on this side? Right? Quick to admit, maybe too much. Or are you somewhere on this side where it's, it's, it's like squeezing, uh, what do they say? squeezing blood from a stone to how to admit that you're wrong? Or are you somewhere in between? Something that I realized, especially after I got married, is how defensive I am. I just, you know, just being honest with you. I don't know about you guys, but that, that's me. So as nice as we are, because I think most of us, we look at ourselves and we go, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> I'm a nice person, right? Until you realize that maybe we're not, right? Um, the reality is there is so much anger and frustration and bitterness that can well up inside of us that starts to spill over into angry thoughts towards other people, into um, hurtful words, into insults to the people around us. And Jesus actually explains in this passage that that actually matters to God. That actually matters. It is a serious matter in the eyes of God. He explains that our angry thoughts and words make us liable to judgment and even the judgment of the fires of hell. I'm like, what? You know, in the past I've read that and I thought, ah, must just be hyperbole, right? And now Jesus must be just trying to make a statement. And as I'm looking at this more and more, I'm realizing, actually, this really matters. And I'm thinking, what? You know, my angry thoughts and angry words to family and friends 
and fellow believers in church, my angry words towards strangers and angry, angry words towards fellow Sydney drivers that I share the road with actually matter to God? What am I going to do? I'm liable for that. What am I going to do? And Jesus says this in Matthew 12, 36. He says, I tell you this, every thoughtless word you speak, you will have to account for on the day of judgment. And again, I'm just being super honest with you. When I've read that in the past, ah, oh, it must just be hyperbole. Surely, surely not. Because it's just too easy, isn't it, right? To just let our words harm and hurt and let the anger just well up outside of uh, and overflow us. And so what are we going to do about this, right? The Word of God says that if we speak a lot, we're going to stumble a lot. And I happen to be one of those people that speaks a lot, which means that I make more mistakes, just on averages, right? And I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And uh, believe it or not, the strategy that Jesus gives to deal with this anger that spills over in our thoughts and words and insults to other people is not actually in this situation, so don't do it. The strategy Jesus gives is actually to seek reconciled relationships. Isn't that fascinating? And I think the reason being, in the process of seeking reconciled relationships, God is able to do something in our hearts that changes who we are. And so, today we're going to be looking at three ways to walk in the freedom of forgiveness. And uh, to make it easy to remember, seek, settle, and share. These are three ways that we can walk in the freedom of forgiveness uh, that God has won for us through Jesus Christ. And a lot of times I might meet people, and sometimes I experience in my own heart, There's a heaviness that we carry because we're not walking in the freedom of forgiveness because we don't understand how powerful forgiveness is. And Jesus wants to set us free from that. And today I'm going to be focusing probably more on the side of when we hurt other people. So uh, how do we deal with that? So next week, Pastor Gene's going to be talking more about when other people hurt us. So today's going to be a bit more leaning on the side of what we do when we're stuffed up. So you ready? Awesome. Thank you, Corey and Tina. All right. So the first thing that we can do to walk in the freedom of forgiveness is to seek reconciliation first. So the the passage uh, Carmen read out for us, right? If you're offering your gift at the altar, you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave it there. Go reconcile, come back. So Jesus' audience that were listening to this teaching, they were in Galilee. And picture this, right? The scenario is that you have traveled 128 kilometers to the temple in Jerusalem, all right? It's probably a once a year thing, possibly even once every two years kind of thing, right? If you're lucky to get there. And you've come to the temple. There it is. And there's the altar. You've brought your gift. It's likely an animal that you're bringing to be able to sacrifice, ask the priest to sacrifice for you, for your sins and the sins of your whole family, so you can be made right with God, so that you can reconcile and restore with Him because of all the mistakes, all the sins that you've you've committed, right? You rock up. You're ready to worship God and be reconciled. You've got your offering there, and you're ready to go. And then at that point, you realize, oh, no. I, I hurt so-and-so. Uh, I did something that offended my sister or my brother. What do you do? Jesus says, you leave that animal there. You leave your gift at the altar. What? I just traveled 128 kilometers to get here. You know, I've come to reconcile with you. And you say, leave it there. Yet yeah, leave it there, Jesus says. Leave it there. Go back, reconcile, come back, offer the gift. Wow. 
You're about to worship God, reconcile with him. And he says, stop, before you go any further, be reconciled with that person first. Then come back. You know, worship, reconciliation with God, him being able to forgive us. Do you know how much that means to God? You do, right? Oh, wow. It matters so much to him. How much does it matter to God? That he would send his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sake and my sake. That is how much it matters. Yet, there is something that he prioritizes before that. That's right relationships with the people around us. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about worship, but it means that he elevates reconciliation with others as the most urgent priority. That blows my mind. Some of you would have seen the, uh, the Matrix, important, urgent, important, not urgent. You know, you've seen that one before, right? <laughs> important, urgent in the eyes of God, reconciliation. Imagine your mum or your dad have a birthday. And if they've passed away, just imagine, you know, just rewind back the clock. And you drive up to Newcastle. It's about 128 k's. You drive up to Newcastle. And, and you're excited. You got the gift there, right? You got a big smile on your face. You love your parents. You know, you just can't wait to reveal your present. They open it up so you can be like, yeah, you know, happy birthday, right? And you turn up there. And then they, 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 they just press pause on the party. And they look you in the eye. It's not personal. I've just, for illustration purposes. They look you in the eye. Corey, I'm so glad you're here. But, you know, you've hurt your brother and sister. That's why they're not here at the party. I'm, just leave your gift right there. I want you to go back to Sydney. It's okay because you drive a Yaris. Good fuel economy. I want you to go back to Sydney. I want you to make peace with them and then come back. And then we'll have the party, okay? What would you say? Are you serious? Something like that is happening here. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's such a powerful principle to seek reconciliation first. Just last week in the city, um, for those of you who don't know, we've, we've got a city congregation um, and, and the base up here at Ryde. In the city, uh, there was a lady that I hadn't seen for years. I remember growing up in youth with her kids, actually. And, um, and she was so excited. And she said, you know, um, you know, Andy, my husband and I, we had a fight. And for three weeks, we didn't talk to each other. I can't imagine not talking to Mel for three weeks. Like, wow, three weeks. It was such a big argument. And she said, you know, I just felt God guiding me to go to church. So I came to church, came back to church in the city. Hadn't seen her for donkey's years. And, um, and I came, and then, and then during the message, it was about softening your heart to God. And I just felt God convict me. I was in tears, just crying the whole service. So when, when I went home, straight away I went back to my husband, and we reconciled. And she said, you know what, it's a miracle. And in my heart, like I, I wouldn't classify that as a miracle, right? But in her, it must have been a big fight, okay? But in her heart, she said, it's a miracle. And as she's telling me this, I'm looking at her husband, and he's going, yeah, yeah, that's a miracle, right? And to see both of them just full of joy, you know? And, and she, the reason why she saw it as a miracle, because all this stuff happened, she didn't know. She felt God saying, come here, and the message that day was about this and that, and then it just brought about restoration, and there was so much joy in them. That's the power of forgiveness, the power of reconciliation. Jesus did not want that couple any longer to walk in the chains of unreconciled and uh, unresolved conflict because he knew he had something better for them. Amen? So beautiful. We have to get past our defense attorney, don't we? 
until we see forgiving Father. And we look in forgiving Father's eyes and we realize he's not only concerned about our relationship with him. Does it matter to him? Yes, it does. But there's something that matters as of more urgency. Our reconciled relationships with those around us. We come to worship him. He looks us in the eye and he says, I need you to go and make peace first and come back. Who are the people that you and I have hurt, harmed, or insulted? I want to encourage us to seek reconciliation as an urgent priority so that you and I can walk in the freedom of forgiveness. It's a beautiful freedom that Jesus has for us, church. Seek reconciliation first. Find freedom in forgiveness. The next thing is to settle things quickly. Uh, Jesus says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. So in this scenario, it's a little bit different, all right? So you've done something that has really hurt someone, and they, it's your adversary, and they're like, you know, I'm going to take you to court for this. And you're on the way to court together. Your freedom is actually on the line. That's what this, this scenario is, is outlining here. You could get thrown to prison if it gets to the judge and the judge goes, you know what, for what you've done, go to prison. Now, um, there's a guy called Jahan Kalanta, and he's a criminal defense lawyer. And um, he, he was sharing a little bit about how, you know, he's with his clients in some of the most vulnerable moments and how they respond to their wrongdoing could be the difference between them going to jail or them going home, literally. It could be the difference between them um, seeing their kids twice a year or seeing them twice a week. It could be the difference between the, the situation getting resolved or never getting resolved. And he said that a vulnerable and authentic apology is actually what makes such a huge difference in the courts, in the eyes of the courts. And I think we need to carry some of that thinking in our approach to broken relationship. Because as much as it matters in the eyes of court, it also makes a huge difference in the eyes of God. To have those vulnerable and authentic apology. How, how do we do it? Jesus says, settle it quickly. Just do it. Do it on the way. How do you settle a matter quickly? It's pretty simple. Admit that we've done wrong. And work a way forward with that person to be able to be to be able to sort it out. And you know, I want to encourage us. You know, I was thinking about this. It's a little bit like mold. You know, you leave mold for a day, may you just get your chucks, you know? You maybe just a bit of water, sort it out. Leave it for a month. Oh, okay. Might need some heavy duty stuff. Leave it for a year. You're gonna need the pros to come in, right? And everyone in your family, including yourself, might get sick as, as a result of that mold. You know, uh, we've, we've got a, a, what used to be a weed at home, it used to be tiny. Then it grew up to about this height. You know, back then, if I wanted to, I could just pull the thing out. But I didn't. <sighs> Why didn't I? <laughs> that thing became a huge tree. And, you know, as early as this year, the beginning of this year, I had my little electric chainsaw. They're not as good as the petrol ones, but I had my little electric train chainsaw, and it was a struggle even to get through one of the branches. I had to call the pros in. And I think, man, if only, if only I'd just done this. Why? Why didn't I? Anyone else have gardening regret like that in their life? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like wisdom teeth. Oh, far out. I went to my, I had four wisdom teeth. Went to my dentist one year. He said, you really got to take out that wisdom tooth. Oh, okay, yeah, no. I, I just want the, the complimentary scale and clean, thanks, because that's what my health insurance covers. Next year, different dentist. You've really got that, got to get that tooth out. Oh, yeah, that, that's what the other guy said, yeah. Year after that, um, Mr. Chin, you're going to have to remove that tooth 
because now it's decaying the one next to it, and your other wisdom tooth has decayed the one next to that too. So uh, I don't know when you want to book it in, but you're going to have to get six teeth removed. One, two, three, four, five, six. If only, if only I'd done that earlier. Do you know, church, I need to eat steak sideways now. I need to go, yeah, yeah, like that. And I miss these two chompers. Every now and then I'm like, Mel, I miss them. If only, if only. Anyone have dental regret here today? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So what's the principle? The principle is you, the longer you leave it, the more pain you'll have to suffer. You leave it till the very end, you've lost your freedom. You're paying for that thing that you did until the last penny is given. See what Jesus is saying, right? Do this. Don't wait till you've got to call the pros in and get the chainsaw. Do this. Don't wait till you lost your whole teeth. Your whole, your, all your teeth. Don't, don't wait till then. And actually, Jesus is actually hinting that this applies to us and to God as well. Settle your sins with God while there is still time. Settle things quickly. Nip it in the bud. You know, I've always regretted not dealing with broken relationship. Like when, I, when I've left it too long, I've always regretted that. And I can tell you now, I have never regretted getting onto a broken situation quickly. Never. Don't let that disagreement be like mold that makes you, your family, your friends sick. You know, Kathy was talking about the impact of gambling. The impact of unforgiveness can be even more rife than that. Don't wait till the weed tree destroys your garden. Don't wait till all your teeth fall out. Don't let your harm land you in prison, physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. It's not worth it. Be free. Walk in the freedom of forgiveness. Amen. And the last one is this. Share forgiveness. So now we're kind of moving into the territory of Okay, when you've hurt someone else, when I've hurt someone else, now what happens when other people hurt us? And next week, Pastor Gene's going to talk a lot more about this, but share forgiveness. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Again, many years ago when I read this, oh, it must just be hyperbole but I'm realizing more and more the power of this truth. Sorry. This is powerful. Forgiveness is central to our faith. Absolutely central. And you know, God's forgiveness and our forgiveness with the people around us, whether we've harmed them or they've harmed us, is absolutely, you can't separate the two things. They're inextricably linked. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Most of us here would know it. Some of us, maybe we uh, memorized it when we were kids. The first, there's only six things that we're asking for in this this prayer. The first three three things are all about God. Your name be honored. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. All about him. Then the next three are all about our needs. Our needs for daily bread, our needs for forgiveness, our needs for deliverance from the enemy. And so when you break this down mathematically, forgiveness makes the top six. If you were to ask Jesus, Jesus, tell me, what are the six most important things that I should be praying for and asking help for from from, from you? I guarantee you, he will say these six things. And one of those six Forgiveness. What does that say? That says then that forgiveness must be in the DNA of every disciple of Jesus. Are you hearing me, church? It needs to be in 
our DNA. It needs to become our second nature because it is central to the gospel message itself. It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It doesn't say, forgive us our debts and then move straight on. Sometimes when we wish that it did, right? <laughs> forgive us, uh, give me my daily bread and forgive me my sins and then just deliver me from the enemy. It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So Jesus' followers, they seek and they share forgiveness. That's just what they do. And they can't do it in their own ability. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the prayer, would it? Why were you praying for? Because we need help to do that. Anyone else here find forgiveness hard? I do. That's so all we need is help for it. It's like a dance with God. His step, our step. I'm not a dancer, so I can't even show you. But anyway, it's like a dance, right? He steps, we step. He forgives as we forgive. That's how this works. And the scriptures confirm this dance. Mark eleven twenty five. When you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive it. Right? Luke 6, 36 to 37, be merciful, even as your Father, whoa, whoa, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful, forgive, and you'll be forgiven. It's, it's a dance that's going on here, a gracious dance, a, 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 a merciful dance. When we are unforgiving, he cannot forgive. I'm going to flick a few quotes here because I found these so insightful. He cannot forgive, for if we are opening, if we are to open our hands to receive his gracious pardon, we cannot keep our fists tightly clenched against those who have wronged us. Just imagine that. God, I want to receive your mercy. I want to receive your mercy. And he's saying, would you just open up your hands and let that go? Because I want to give it to you. I do. I want to pour this out on you. But if you're going to keep your, 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 your fists clenched like that, I can't. I just can't. Our determination not to forgive another is a form of impenitence that blocks the flow of divine forgiveness. In other words, when we repent, God is like, yes, pours out his grace. But actually, when we choose to not forgive others, it's actually holding back of true repentance, if that makes sense. It's impenitence. And it blocks the flow. Does Jesus want to pour out that flow of his grace? Yes, 100% he does. And he doesn't want this to get in the way. Have a look at this next quote. It's by John Stott, one of my favorite Christian writers. If you haven't read any of his stuff, got to check it out. It's awesome. But he says this, God forgives only the penitent. And one of the chief evidences of true penitence is a forgiving spirit. Wow. Once our eyes have been opened to see the enormity of our offense against God, the injuries which others have done to us appear by comparison extremely trifling. If, on the other hand, we have an exaggerated view of the offenses of others, it proves we have minimized our own. It is the disparity between the size of debts which is the main point of the parable of the unmerciful servant. Wow, yeah, that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Wow. So when I look at that, what does that then mean? Well, the forgiven are forgiving, aren't they? The forgiven are forgiving. The truly penitent are those who release others from the small offenses that they've caused, that we might receive grace for all the offenses that we've caused. It's the grace of God. Seeking and sharing forgiveness is a dance that every believer needs to know how to dance because true repentance lets go to be able to receive grace. So share forgiveness with others. Yeah? Forgiven people are forgiving people. Did I get that right? Yes, I did. Okay. Forgiven people are a forgiving people. 
Well, so they're the three S's. Seek reconciliation, settle quickly, share forgiveness. These are three simple ways that we can walk in the freedom of forgiveness that God has for us. And how do we do this? You know, some of us have had terrible things happen to us. I was thinking about my uh, adopted uh, nan. So she's passed away now. But she said to me that when she was about 20 years old, she uh, fell pregnant. And uh, for some reason, the baby uh, that was in her womb, the umbilical cord got wrapped around the baby, and the baby didn't develop properly. And when the baby was born, uh, only survived for about, I think it was about eight or ten months, and then the baby died. And it was terrible. It was really sad. And then one day, she made some small mistake in the kitchen. And her mother-in-law said, Annie, you can't do anything right. You can't even have children right. My gosh. Isn't that terrible? And my nan was telling me this story. She's in her early 80s. And she's saying with this glint in her eye, I just never had any time for her after that. In other words, I just couldn't forgive her. And I thought about that. I, I thought about it and I thought, you know what? How sad. Well, one, how sad that the mum in law said that, right? But also how sad that my nan also just felt like it was an irreconcilable difference. Uh, look, I'm not blaming her because that's terrible, man. It's hard enough to deal with the pain of losing your child than to deal with that. But I guess what's sad is that what she said to my nan kind of put her in this little prison. But my nan's response put my nan in a prison as well. And as a result, bitterness, resentment, broken relationship, how many decades of joy could they have experienced in their relationship if it wasn't for that? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And so this life of reconciliation and restoration and forgiveness is only possible. It's not possible in your strength and my strength. I am not strong enough to be this way. It's only possible by the grace of Jesus. It's the only way, my friends. It's only because he offered us his forgiveness. It's only because he carried on himself all of our sin and our brokenness and the ways in which we stuffed up. And I have stuffed up so many times. It's only because of what he did through his amazing sacrifice that we might be forgiven. That we have the strength and the power by his spirit to be a forgiving people. And through his cross, not only does he forgive, but he, crea he, he started a movement of reconciliation and restoration across the world. Receiving his forgiveness and his spirit empowers us to forgive others. And Jesus is the means and the model for our forgiveness. Does that make sense, church? He's the means and the model for our forgiveness. It's because of His forgiveness of us and His Spirit that He fills us with that we are able to pour out that forgiveness to others. But He's also the model for it. Through the way that He lived, through all that He did, He shows us how we can walk as a people that forgive other people. Have you been forgiven here today? Have you received the forgiveness of God? Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you opened up your heart to him? And I want to ask alongside that, as you have asked for his grace, have you also opened your hands to let go of the harm that others have caused you?
this morning, if you haven't yet done that, then I want to urge you from the depth of my heart, open up your hands to receive the grace of God as you open up your hands to release the hurt of others. It's one movement, my friends. Do that and receive his kindness and feel him lift the the weight off your shoulders. As I was praying earlier today, I saw a couple of images. One of those was I saw that God was changing the price tags on the way that we see forgiveness. Some of us don't see it as a big thing. And God is helping us to see how important it is, not just for us, but the people around us, not just for now, but for eternity. But the second thing I saw was hands that had been really, uh, what's the word, chafed because the chains on them were just so painful. And you know the pain, that unforgiveness, or that hurt that maybe you've done to someone else that hasn't been resolved, has been having. It's felt a bit like that. It's felt like these chains that have been chafing on you, and you just want to take them off. Because you know that it's hurting you, and maybe even hurting the people around you. Then I want to encourage you today, if that's you, open your heart to Jesus and just let go. Let him remove those chains so that they're not harming you anymore. So if you have not yet opened your hands, I want to encourage you to do so. And if you have, I want to encourage you to commit to making sharing and seeking forgiveness a top six in your life. If someone looks at Andy's life or Joel's life or Lynn's life, or Jaslyn's life, or someone looks at Brian's life, that they see that top six part of their personality, the way that they live, is that they are a forgiven and forgiving people. Amen? That they would just feel that vibe from us. A vibe that points to the Lord Jesus himself. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and, and uh, lead us in worship now. But before they actually sing, I want to urge us with this soul training. Hey, there it is. Okay. The soul training for this week is forgiven to forgive. especially on the side of people that we may have, might have hurt, I want to encourage us. Is there someone that you need to seek, settle, or share forgiveness with? Ask God. This morning I was ironing my shirt. I said, Lord, is there someone I need to, that I've hurt that I need to talk to? And he brought someone to mind. I'm like, oh, wow. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I need to deal with that. Just ask the Lord to bring those people to mind. Make it a priority. Remember, urgent, you know, urgent, important. This is in that category. Why am I saying before we sing? Because I want to imagine us coming to the altar. Before we give our offering of worship to God, to actually have a moment with Him right now. And I want to encourage us to do something about it. Doing something for you might mean I'm going to call them, we're going to catch up, and I'm going to say sorry. Doing something might mean, oh man, it's a big one. I might need to talk to auntie so-and-so because they're closer to them and get a sense of what the best way is to sort this out. Next step might be strategizing how to do it. Next step might be, God, I need your strength to be able to do this because I've hurt this person really badly. And I don't know if I've got the courage to even even talk to them about this. But I want to encourage you to do something about it. Because there is a freedom that God has for you and I to walk in. The freedom of forgiveness. It is joyful. It is light. (sighs) Do something about it.
And the second thing I want to encourage us to do is to ask the Holy Spirit to help us become a more forgiving, forgiven person. In other words, Spirit of God, make me more like Jesus so that forgiveness just oozes out of my life. That sound okay, church? I want to ask, if you heard this message today and you want to make a commitment to to making, seeking and sharing forgiveness a top six priority in your life, you want to say, yes, I really want to do something about that. I, I really want to take this commitment seriously. Then just give me, just lift up your hand if that's you. Yes, I want to make this a commitment in my life. Awesome. Anyone else here? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to especially pray for you right now, and then I'm going to give us a moment to just wait upon God. Jesus, for my sisters and brothers who have lifted their hands, I put my hand alongside them. I want to make this, Lord God, a serious priority in my life alongside my sisters and brothers. And we ask of you for your help because, God, we know how unaware we can be of the ways in which we hurt other people. And, God, we know how how finicky we can be with the way that people harm us. And Lord, we know that some of the things we've done have hurt people a lot. Some of the things that people have done to us have hurt us a lot. But we just want to say to you with, 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 as we lift up our hands that we want to make that commitment and we need your help, Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts afresh, to soften them so much that your forgiveness is like a river of grace that flows out into the streams of our relationships of the people in our lives. Be they strangers on Sydney roads, be they friends, be they family members who we've, yeah, we've had a long history with, be they people, Lord God, in our workplaces or even things that people have done to us when we were very young. We bring ourselves before you. We ask for your help to be a more forgiving people as we are a forgiven people. Spirit of God, mark this commitment in our hearts, we pray, because we can't do it without you. Only by your grace, only by your goodness, I work in us. Hallelujah. And church, we're going to enter into a bit of a time now to just pray. Uh, And in your heart, Between you and Jesus, I would encourage you to just ask him, Lord, are there people that I've hurt that I need to make amends with? And just let those people come to mind. If you need to, you might need to make a note of them so that you can remember to ask God for help to do something about it this week. But let's do that. Before we offer our gift of worship at the altar with this next song, let's pray and ask God for help to reconcile with our sisters and our brothers. to know what to do, that you would give us the words to stay, that you would give us the strength to do something about it. Thank you, God, that 
we can do this by your forgiveness, which flows like a beautiful river through our lives, washing away our sin. We can do this by the power of your Spirit, who is the river of living water that flows up within us, spilling out of our hearts. Thank you, God, for the freedom of forgiveness. Let the chains come off. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, why don't we stand and worship God now?